This is Victor Nathaniel Rivas, aged 18, accused of the murder of 15-year-old Ethan Soto in May 2022, and possible involvement in the death of Soto's sister and her boyfriend. In May 2022, Victor Rivas allegedly targeted Ethan Soto in retaliation for the purported theft of THC cartridges. It's going to come out that that conversation was about drugs. A defendant's cousin was going to buy THC cartridges from Sebastian. Angered by the theft, Rivas reportedly fired shots at Soto's family home, although Soto managed to escape unharmed. Scary moments as shots ring out in a southeast side neighborhood, leaving the family inside this home scrambling. My husband's yelling at me, get down, get down, get down on the floor. Attempting to settle the dispute, Soto's mother met with Rivas to reimburse him for the stolen cartridges, a claim Rivas denies. Instead, Rivas contacted an underage girl on Instagram, asking her to arrange a drug deal with Soto, expressing his intent to retaliate against the theft. He repeatedly expressed his intention to catch the person who had robbed him. The drug deal arrangement ultimately led to Soto's ambush by Rivas. Then, not long after, Soto's pregnant sister, Savannah, 18, was found dead along with her boyfriend, Matthew Guerra, 22, three days after they were reported missing. However, detectives are investigating their deaths as possible homicides, as it's unclear if their cases have any connections to Ethan's killing. Following these events, Victor Rivas was arrested and faced trial for the murder of Ethan Soto in October 2022. However, during his testimony in a San Antonio courtroom, chaos erupted as members of the Soto family confronted him. Four relatives of Ethan Soto engaged in a violent altercation with Rivas. The brawl lasted over 30 seconds. With one of Soto's male relatives jumping over the railing to attack the accused murderer. Case 2. A similar case occurred in Louisville, Kentucky, where 31-year-old Paul Wade faces charges of two counts of murder and possession of a handgun as a convicted felon. The charges stem from the deaths of 25-year-old Alexis McCrary and 26-year-old Edward Smith, who were both fatally shot three weeks prior, not far from each other. Surveillance footage implicates Wade as the gunman in both incidents. Wade, already under probation for drug and firearm offenses, is further charged with both murders, although police have yet to establish a clear motive behind the shootings. In the courtroom, Judge Ann Haney presides over Wade's arraignment, during which the first signs of trouble start to show. Some members of the victim's families present at the gallery were heard making noises, for which they were cautioned by the deputies in the court. Once the deputy succeeded in restoring order in the courtroom, Wade's hearing continued. No talking in the courtroom. Yes. That's all. Go ahead. Where it was determined that the absence of legal representation for him means Judge Haney has to reschedule the hearing for a later date. And this is where the real trouble started. As Wade is escorted out of the courtroom, he directs an expletive toward the victim's family members, further escalating the already tense atmosphere. The situation spirals out of control when several family members attempt to confront Wade, resulting in chaos within the courtroom. Wade manages to evade the turmoil by slipping through a door behind the bench, leaving both the judge and spectators in shock. Deputies swiftly pursue the agitated family members while Judge Haney takes measures to alert security and calls for assistance. Ultimately, four individuals from the gallery are arrested for disorderly conduct and obstruction of government function. While Paul Wade didn't get sentenced in this case, the next case, one which we pulled from the archives, shows what happens when the victim's family doesn't agree with the court verdict. Case 3 
The year is 1992, and the accused is 15-year-old James Douglas Gonzalez, accused of shooting 18-year-old Matthew Hall to death. The incident occurred nine months earlier at a local motel, where Hall approached a car containing Gonzalez as a passenger. Gonzalez claimed self-defense, stating that Hall attacked him after an altercation leading to the fatal shooting. As the trial progresses, tension mounts in the courtroom evident with a dozen police officers and sheriff's deputies stationed around. The victim's father, Matthew Hall Sr., and his younger brother, Kevin, anxiously await the jury's verdict, hoping for a conviction of murder against Gonzalez. However, tensions erupt when the jury convicts Gonzalez of a lesser charge, criminally negligent homicide, instead of murder. Kevin Hall reacts impulsively, leaping over, leaping over a partition to charge at Gonzalez, landing a punch on his face. Matthew Sr. joins the altercation, <laughs> resulting in a chaotic scene that takes eight people to restrain the halls and restore order. Gonzalez emerges from the skirmish relatively unscathed and is escorted from the courtroom while paramedics attend to those injured in the chaos. Mobile County Circuit Judge Braxton Cottrell imposes a five-day jail sentence for contempt of court on Matthew Sr. and Kevin Hall, although they are released after spending only one night behind bars. Gonzalez returns a month later for sentencing and receives the maximum penalty allowed for the misdemeanor charge, one year in prison. Gonzalez here was able to hold up the self-defense card as a reason for the crime he committed, but what reasons could the next accused possibly have because he committed one of the worst murders ever? Case 4 This is James Henderson III, accused of the tragic murders of his best friend Hario Taylor, Lemon Bryant, Shailana Williams, and Sharita Johnson, who was pregnant at the time of her death along with the injury of a nine-year-old all members of his best friend's family. The incident occurred in November 2014, and reports revealed that Henderson still possessed the murder weapon in his belt when arrested six months after the tragic events. In a courtroom in Cleveland, James Henderson III pleaded guilty to the tragic murders. During a victim impact statement, emotions escalated when Delray Sanders, a brother of one of the victims, directed his frustrations towards Henderson. Your purpose was what? We have no sister, no mother, nobody for nothing. It's gone. Of a senseless act, you, for nothing. They didn't want to be bothered with you. You weren't satisfied enough. They gave you everything you had. You your own man. Why you didn't get your own? Sanders expressed his disdain, calling Henderson pitiful, and vowed to support his family with all his might. My sister opened the door for you. Look out for you. Acknowledge you. You were scum. You know you are. Sanders' emotions reached a breaking point, and he lunged at Henderson before being escorted out of the courtroom by police. I'm just thankful the guy had made a way for us to find out who you are and who you is. You can breathe like that. I'm just thankful the guy had made a way for us to find out who you are and who you is. You can breathe like that. The intense confrontation led to a brief recess ordered by the judge. Ultimately, Henderson received a severe penalty of five consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Now, not all murder cases are intentional, as we all know, but as you'll see, this fact makes no difference to the families of the victims. Case 5 
This case happened in Syracuse, New York in 2022, where Wendell McNeil, 28, faced sentencing for the murder of Alan Michael Walker on February 16, 2022. McNeil had admitted to fatally stabbing Alan Michael Walker while on work release from state prison. He was in court after pleading guilty to second-degree manslaughter in May, claiming self-defense against Walker's alleged attempt on his life. During his sentencing for manslaughter, McNeil was addressing the court before Judge Gordon Cuffey pronounced his sentence when chaos erupted. A man, presumably associated with the victim's family, stood up, unleashed a barrage of expletives at McNeil, and attempted to attack him. Another man swiftly followed suit, escalating the situation further. Despite McNeil's attempts to express remorse and offer apologies to Walker's family and friends, the two men from the victim's family rushed towards him, causing a commotion. Court officers intervened, restraining the men and leading them out of the courtroom in handcuffs. They were later charged with disorderly conduct and second-degree criminal contempt, receiving appearance tickets and release. Amidst the chaos, Judge Cuffey appealed for calm, emphasizing the tragedy of the situation for Walker's family. After ensuring McNeil was unharmed, the sentencing resumed. Ultimately, McNeil received a sentence of seven and a half to 15 years in prison, a reduction from the potential 25 years to life sentence he faced for murder. Walker's mother, before the disruption, expressed her profound grief and unforgiving stance towards McNeil's actions. He said that, you know, all this was her fault if she just would have answered the phone, um, that she, he continuously tried to call her all day. He called her and called her and she wouldn't answer the phone and if she would have answered the phone, none of this would have happened. Critiquing the plea agreement and the district attorney's handling of the case. While there might be arguments concerning the nature of the plea deal for this case and its effect on the eventual sentence, there was no need for a plea deal in the next case. Case 6. This is Yorin Balbuena. 33, during his sentencing for the stabbing death of his girlfriend, 31-year-old Ziara Patina Trejo, nearly four years ago in California. The tragic incident unfolded on February 27, 2020, in their Simi Valley apartment during an argument between Balbuena and Patina Trejo, characterized by a history of domestic violence. Unable to contact her daughter, Patino Trejo's mother, Ariadna Avatissian went to the couple's home and saw signs of more abuse on her daughter's face. Balbuena would not let Patino Trejo out of the apartment and grabbed a kitchen knife, stabbing Avatissian twice in the head before attacking her daughter. Balbuena then stabbed Patina Trejo more than 30 times with multiple knives, killing her. The victim's mother ran bleeding from the apartment and contacted a bystander who called 911. As soon as I saw the blood, that's when I realized something wasn't right. So I called my mom to let her know to come over and then I immediately called 911. The DA said. Police responded to the scene and arrested Balbuena. Three days after the attack, he was charged with the murder of Patino Trejo. Balbuena was convicted by a jury on November 21, 2023 for the first-degree murder of Patino Trejo, as well as for battery causing great bodily injury and assault with a deadly weapon against her mother.